tonight. I'm delighted to be in studio with someone who's funny, feisty, talented, and just one of the best cartoonists around. Uh, her new book is called Writer. Writer. So sorry, and uh, she'll correct me if I get things wrong. Pretty in Pink, the incomparable. Pretty in Ink. Please. Pretty in Ink. You see, I'm doing a horrible job. Yes. Trina Robbins, how are you? Hi. It's good to you know, see you. I, I haven't seen you in many years. I, know. I, I just saw something on your bio that I loved that said you were a self-described queer friendly het. Yes, I am. I'm also a friend of Friends of Dorothy. A Friends of Dorothy, which of course now a whole new generation of gay men don't even realize I, they're talking about. I love about, that title. About, I'm also, of course, Friends of Toto because I love animals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably maybe the most gay-friendly heterosexual woman I certainly know. Oh, I'm sure there's lots more. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have clearly a huge body of work. I remember when I met you now almost 30 years ago, you were one of the first women cartoonists. I mean, that's pretty yes. much a man's world. No, I was. I was. I was an underground cartoonist. Um, this was in the days when um, underground comics were totally male-dominated. It's still pretty male-dominated, but there are many, many more women in the industry now. Um, but I'm a writer now. I'm a full-time writer. I haven't drawn a comic in 30 years. Well, you, so I'm, I, I just caught you. Yes. Now, the book that you were working on then at that time, a very different period, the late 80s, was called Strip AIDS. Strip AIDS USA. And it was the first cartoon book about the AIDS epidemic, correct? Yes, yes. My inspiration, I was in England, and this wonderful man had done a, uh, put together an anthology called Strip AIDS. That's why we called our strip. I looked at it and I said, we can do this, you know. Uh, so I came home and I found two people, wonderful people who were willing to work with me. I co-edited it. One of the uh, people was Bill Sienkiewicz, who is a mainstream, very famous mainstream cartoonist, and he got the mainstream guys. Uh, the other was Robert Tripto, who, an old friend of mine who was editing gay comics, and he got the gay men, and I got the women. Right. I mean, how hard was it back in the 80s when people, gay or straight, didn't want to talk about AIDS to put together a comic book dealing with it? I mean, not this, hard at all. This is not uh, musical comedy. Not hard at all. Um, we even it was even easy to get it published. Um, I called Ron Turner, who has a comic book company called Last Gasp, still has it. I phoned him to ask him if he would publish this for free, mind you, because it was a benefit book. All the money, nobody was getting any money out of this. And before I could even finish saying, we want to do a book about AIDS, he interrupted me and said, yes. That's, that's how wonderful he is and how easy it was. Right. Now, you said you haven't picked up a, a pencil or uh, a brush to do. I doodle. You doodle. But now you're doodling as a writer. Yes. Do you miss doodling as a cartoonist? Not at all. I am so happy that I became a writer. The smartest thing I ever did was become a writer. So what was the flash of inspiration? I mean, were those 30 years a mistake? No, of course not. I'm very proud <laughs> of the things I did. And, and in there, if you will, open Justin Hall's book, No Straight Lines. It's a great book. Justin was actually on the show a few months yes. back. Yes. Well, you will see. Um, the very first comic ever done about a lesbian, drawn by me in 1972 for the first issue of Women's Comics, which was the longest running um, all-woman anthology. And then you will see. I think we have paper dolls I, in here. That's what you're going to see. And you see my Gertrude and Alice paper dolls. Wow, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm throwing this at the crew with a little bit no notice, but we'll try on camera three here to get paper dolls of Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Topas. There are only one, two Gertrude and Alice's. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated by them, but I especially like Alice. She's, and I love her cookbook. Mm -hmm. So now, how did this start? I mean, you know, the other thing, I, I, I love your bios because I've read several over the years and they keep changing. You write them fresh. You're a writer. You're not a historian. You're her a historian. her historian. Uh, you're a feminist. Um, but, you know, most femi you know, feminists don't necessarily dress so girly and, and femi. You look, I mean, great. I love girly and femi. Is that against the grain, you think? I don't know, but for me, one of the reasons I came on this show, agreed to be on the show, was because they said that somebody would do my makeup. <laughs> and Erica did a beautiful job. She did a beautiful job. Yeah, yeah. Now, now as a writer, 
What you say, you know, you have this book now, Pretty in Ink, North American Women Cartoonists, 1896 to 2013. I didn't even know there were any North American cartoonists from 1896. That's two years before my grandmother was born. Well, the first comic, I found it. I mean, as far as anyone knows, at this point, because I found it, um, people sort of generally agree that it's probably the first comic by a woman, was drawn by Rose O'Neill, who later went on to create the Cupies and was very famous. Um, it was in a magazine called Truth. It's a little four-panel comic, and it's the very first comic ever done by a woman. Um, after that, I kind of skip about about four years and go on to 1900 and 1901, when you suddenly all these women were appearing in newspapers. Uh, Rose O'Neill, Grace Drayton, who created the Campbell Kids, and also did these mm. adorable paper. Do um, uh, excuse me, these adorable comics. Um, Lots of women, you, you just find them. And there was no, in the early 20th century, in newspapers, nobody thought, oh, these are women, they shouldn't be drawing comics. No one thought that. Do you know when it got, when the industry got really male dominated? After the Second World War. During the war, all, uh, many, many of the guys who were drawing comics were draft age. Mm -hmm. They either enlisted or they were drafted and they went overseas. And as in every other industry, their spots were filled by women. women. Mm -hmm. Then the guys came home, they wanted their jobs back. The women were pushed into the kitchen, out of the office and into the kitchen. What I find interesting about this book, Pretty in Ink, 1896 to 2013 is, 1896, that's 20 some years before women had the vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, so were there you know, were, were there drawings political? Were they about home and hearth? I mean, is there any sort of theme? Some that of them pulls were them political. Together? A lot of them were feminists, were suffragettes or suffragists, whatever you want to call uh -huh. it. Um, I would say that most of them were suffragists. Mm -hmm. And that was, of course, that was their politics at the time. Right. Did you come across any husband-wife teams or even women-women teams? Any, any lesbians in this, uh, uh, in this group? There may have been, I mean, I'm sure there were more, but it's possible that there was one in the 40s who drew for comic books. Uh, I really will never know except that I have been told that she lived in Greenwich Village and that she was very masculine. Mm -hmm. You know, that, so, you know, maybe. A little bit of hint. Yeah, A bit yeah, of hint. yeah. Do you think now that comic book art is beginning to be more accepted as an art form? The reason I ask this is because, for instance, right now, George Lucas, who's more famous as the creator of Star Wars, is developing a museum, the Lucas yes. Cultural Arts Museum, and a huge part of its collection and a huge part of George's collection, I, I've seen it, is cartoon and comic book art. And he has gone on the record as saying, one of the reasons I want to create this museum is to give this art its due. A lot of people didn't even consider Norman Rockwell or Maxfield Parrish artists. Do you think that this is about uh, giving these women artists their artistic due? Well, my books certainly are. My books are, are about, you know, okay, one major thing, uh, it was like my my epiphany when I started collecting, writing these histories of women cartoonists was that if you're not written about, you're forgotten. And these women have been forgotten because when the guys write books about comics, they don't even see the women. It's like they have blinders on. They somehow don't see the women, but I see the women. And now they're not forgotten. Mm -hmm. So now, now that you're not drawing anymore professionally, you're doodling. Yes. So we don't have any more doodles? We're not going to have any more published books of Trina Robbins doodles? You're going to have tons of published books, but they're my writing. Right, right, right. Are you, is there this little club, though, of uh, women cartoonists still around the Bay Area? I mean, it seemed when I came here in the 80s, there was a real large group of women doing cartooning. And I don't well, care about it as much anymore. In the 70s and 80s, there was women's comics. And a lot of women kind of centered around that. Uh, women's Comics ended in 92. Women's Comics was the not the first anthology. The first all-woman anthology was called It Ain't Me Babe Comics, and I put that together and edited and produced it. Um, that was 1970. The second was 1972, Women's Comics. It lasted till 1992, making it the longest-lasting anthology, Women's Comics anthology. Um, 
And there was a, a group of women that kind of circulated around women's comics. It was kind of cool. We were an art gang, but that's over. Right. Now, <clears throat> you said that when men write about cartooning, they kind of ignore the women. Do you think that's just conscious, or is there still a sexism within the cartooning Actually, industry? Actually, I think it's subconscious. Somehow they don't see the women. It's really fascinating to me. Uh -huh. I don't think that I don't think they plan it that way. I don't think they whisper to each other, "Hey, let's <laughs> leave out the chicks." No, but know? my point is, I mean, a lot of men cartoon. I mean, you know, chicks are a fun thing to draw for certainly straight men cartoonists. I mean, so a lot of the cartoons we see, the images of women. Oh my God, those images! The uh, way the mainstream guys draw women. Yeah. So what do you, what do you have to say about that? Well, you know. You, they don't, they're not even looking at real women. I mean, the mainstream superhero artists draw women with gigantic breasts bigger than their heads, you know, and, and legs that are like twice as long as their <laughs> body and running around fighting crime in spike heels shoes, which is, you know, you try it. Um, it's like they're not looking at real women. Uh -huh. they, it's, they've got this image in their head from when they were, you know, when they were oversexed teenage boys uh -huh. and they're really still oversexed teenage boys right. even if they're 30 or 40. So how did you draw women but also as a straight woman how did you draw men? I always had a hard time drawing men if you must know. Um, I prefer to draw women I guess because when I drew women I was drawing myself mm -hmm. and I think it's the same with the guys. I think that when they draw men they're drawing themselves or at least they're drawing their fantasy of themselves because they're adding on an awful lot of muscle. Mm -hmm. um, but when they're drawing women, they're not drawing real women. Mm -hmm. Now, you've written this book, Pretty in Ink, 1896 to 2013. Yes. Why 1896? You see, that, that well, was the first woman. The, yes. But I mean, you know, come on, cartooning and doodling is as old as the ruins in Pompeii, well, if not we'll older. Well, we'll never know who drew the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, you know, those those wall paintings where they actually do have little balloons coming out of their their Right, heads. those are cartoons. Yeah, but we'll never know if those were women or if those were men. I would guess that some of them were women, but we don't know. You know, they're not, if they are signed, you know, they're not signed with you know, we don't know male from female names in ancient Egypt. Maybe we do, but we really don't know who drew that. Right. So now that this is done, what's next for you? Oh, well, actually, I'm about to sign a contract to write my memoirs. <laughs> Sex, drugs, and rock and roll in comics? Is that what it's called? Se no, no. no. <laughs> it, it's no a, but it, it would sell, Trina. Uh, that's a good one. Sex, drug, and rock and roll in comics. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about, of course. No, I'm calling it Last Girl Standing. Uh huh. Do you think of yourself that way sometimes? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm still here. You know, not everyone, people, women, from the early days of women's comics, the majority of them stopped drawing. They're doing something else. Or maybe they're drawing, but it's, you know, you know some form of commercial art or animation or, or they're teaching, you know? Mm -hmm. But very, very, very few of them are still drawing. Of course, neither am I. I'm writing. Right. But you don't seem to have any regrets. None. No regrets, but what was then the best part of your, your life? I think this is the best part of my life. The only thing I don't like is growing older. If I could just even just stay the way I am right now and not get any older, mm -hmm. it would be divine. And is that just because of, you know, physical challenges or just because... Well, because the older you get, the closer you are to death. Uh-huh. So no, no immortality yet. You don't. No immortality yet. Right. I mean, you'd think if they can send a man to the moon, they can make us immortal. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, it took them a long time to, you know, build the Bay Bridge. I mean, you know, technology. God, yeah. really? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we only have a few minutes left. Any advice to a budding woman cartoonist out there now, or a budding historian or writer? The advice from Trina Robbins. Don't take no for an answer. Uh, don't just, if you get like one rejection, if you get even five rejections, don't go, oh no, nobody wants my work. Keep trying. Dr. Seuss's first book was rejected 26 times. That's what I tell, I've taught classes, I tell my students that. It's the first thing I tell them. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Trina Robbins, an inspiration to us all, from the pages of History, Herstory, sorry, and the comic book to the musical stage. Next up, our conversation with the leader of the New Century Chamber Orchestra. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. Very